Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show where we talk about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we share our stories of connection to the big mystery, to the divine, to ourselves as divine, to what we're doing here on earth, what this is all about, and to being the, the artist of our dream of life. And today I have a beautiful guest on for that discussion. I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird, and I love these conversations. These conversations light me up. I love to hear the way that the divine has woken people and works with people. We all are so unique and yet there's pieces of the journey that we share in common and it's so uh, beautiful to me to hear those stories and to have those points of connection. So I invite you to this beautiful conversation today. Uh, today we have uh, Don Jose Ruiz with us. Welcome uh, Don Jose, welcome to the show. Thank you, Carrie. I'm so happy to be here with you this morning and thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm so delighted. So Don Jose Ruiz is the international best-selling author of The Fifth Agreement. As a Toltec master of transformation and modern-day shaman, he has dedicated his life to sharing the wisdom of the ancient Toltec through his books, lectures, and journeys to sacred sites around the world. Other books include The Ripples of Wisdom, My Good Friend of Rattlesnake, The Wisdom of the Shamans, and his newly released book, The Medicine Bag, Shamanic Rituals and Ceremonies for Personal Transformation. And I know that you guys have been watching the show a while. You know that I'm a huge fan of um, uh, Don, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, who is uh, Don Jose's father, and uh, that that book, The Four Agreements, changed my life, and I wished I had read it in third grade. I don't know why it's not third grade reading. Um, it should be in every third grade classroom for every student because it's so powerful. So, um, Don Jose, on that look, I want to ask you some questions. I have some curiosities, and then I want to get into your work. My first curiosity, though, is like how you grew up with such a um, powerful family, like everybody in your family, your father, all these people, so, so powerful in their message and in their spiritual teachings. What was that like for you? Like, what was it like to grow up there? And what was it like for you to find your own voice in the middle of all of that? Well, the, the beautiful thing that grew up in a family of respect, everything was based on respect. Even if making the, well, we can say the wrong choices, but the wrong choices are not wrong because they led us to a point of view to growth. But uh, yes, everything was about respect. And one thing that my family taught me is that we all humans are living in a world full of magic. And, the, and to activate the magic, you have to believe in yourself. And one thing that my grandmother told me says, okay, now that you know that we live in a world full of magic, if you copy what I'm doing, you're killing the Toltec tradition. And if you copy what your father's doing, you're killing the Toltec tradition. To keep the Toltec tradition alive, you have to overcome yourself, all the negativity, all the doubt. Everything that the world has domesticated you with, that doesn't belong to you. You have to find your own voice. And when you find your own voice, you find the reflection of your inner love, because that's what it's all about in this life. When you wake up that inner love, you wake up in a world where you know, like Father is crossing the four agreements in a world where everybody's completely drunk and you're the only sober person, but they're drunk with the addiction of suffering. So when you become aware, it's because you find that self-respect. But tell your sister, it took a long time to get my own voice because, you know, because growing up, I felt like there was something wrong with me because the world is full of, you know, addiction of suffering, of, you know, drama, victimization, and that's what it means to be a grown-up, to be full of all that negativity like a soap opera, like the drama in the sad songs, in the, in the movies, in the books. So I felt like it was a whole point of sacrificing the love of my life until, you know, uh, one marriage and, uh, and, and a few relationships, especially the one with myself, and especially when I begin numbing myself, trying to escape, trying to away, run away from me, it comes a point that, you know, like my father says, you can run away if you don't like certain people, you can run, run away from them, but you can never run away from yourself. From that moment, I begin having my own voice because it was up to me what kind of life I wanted to live. But yes, my family always said, you... You grew up in a world of magic. You can do negative magic or positive magic. That is so powerful because it took me a really long time to realize that I was a magic maker and that I was like a spider weaving a web of my reality all around myself, like the spider weaving the web. So I was the spider, the web, and the fly that I was trapping inside my web. So it took me so long to realize that. I had like two decades of psychotherapy on the weekly, on the couch, talking about all my problems and everything. And I thought that was making it better, but it, it wasn't making it better. I had to find another way. And I had to go into darkness. I'd like you to talk about, if you will share, 
um, your descent into darkness because um, I've gone that path of having to go down really deep into my own darkness. And um, it, on the outside, it looks like a mess and, and people judge it. But there's actually something really powerful happening, and I'd love you to talk about that. Yes, one thing that I found out in my path, uh, no one, it's no one's business how I heal myself. Because how I heal myself is how I learn to survive in darkness. And when I'm in darkness, I'm alone. Those people who, who are putting all the points of view or the advice are not there with me. I'm there with myself. And about darkness, you know, I, I was like you, what you're describing. I, like for the longest time, I thought that I was a fly getting stuck in a dream catcher. And until I realized that I was my own dream catcher. So the being the fly, I always make all these excuses, justification, why am I suffering, to keep my suffering alive. But in the Tophet tradition, in one of my meditations, I discovered in my inner wisdom, in my vision questing, that, you know, when we wake up, especially when we begin to service, when we become to be a service in a tradition of, you know, light workers or whatever you want to name it, the ones who are service to bring heaven to earth, because you're giving heaven to yourself. So we are born into the light, you know, then we get a heartbreak. And then we find an angel that ushers us to the underworld, and the underworld is darkness. And then we get all the blessing in the dark world, and then we find light in the dark world. But then something happens. We come out of the darkness into the light, and we think, oh, we're, we're done with ourselves. I'm done. And then Mother Nature says, oh, no, you're not done yet. You're going back into the darkness, into the light, into the darkness, into the light. Happy, not happy. Heaven, not heaven. Truth, lies. And it's all a cycle, a habit, until we wake free. So right now, I, I know in my heart that all the times I went into darkness, it was supposed to be, because it did happen. I wasn't, I'm not here to say it wasn't supposed to happen, because it did happen, and I did my best. But then I knew, when I made the intent, you know, I was put into darkness because something outside believed that I can overcome it. So I just had to believe in myself that I overcome darkness. So now in my everyday life, no matter what life awareness that I have, darkness still comes my way. But the beautiful thing now is that I have my own light. So when there's darkness that comes into my life, I, I change the light and I learn something else from it. And when I get out into the light again, I have more wisdom. I have more love to, to give. I have more support to give, more strength to give. And uh, this is what happens very beautifully in life because darkness makes us what we are. There is no saint, like my grandma used to say, that wasn't a sinner first. And a sinner is a made-up word to make us feel guilt and shame with our own story. So when we are in the darkness, because we find a darkness inside of our mind, that when we light up, everything begins to change because we know that we are the love of our life. And that, you know, every time darkness comes, it's like an umbrella. The thing it is to not take ourselves personal, to not hurt ourselves. And then when we know out in life, we know that judgment is an illusion because people throw it at us and we use it against ourselves. We use people to hurt ourselves with. And when we wake up, we stop that because now we know what darkness gives to us because we're part of it, because it's part of life. Darkness and light is all part of life. So when we make the perfect equilibrium with everything, you know, we're, we're not victims. We don't, we don't say, oh, poor me, I wasn't supposed to say, no. I'm put there because I can overcome it. And that's the beautiful thing about you know, of having our spirit broken and going into darkness is that once it's broken, it cannot be broken again. That's so powerful. Once it's broken, it cannot be broken again. You know, I went through this process myself and I had to find my own way out and I had to find my own medicine. And we're going to talk about that in a little while too. But now as a mother, I watch my son go through this. And it's really different from that perspective because my heart just, it just opens so much and I want to help. And it seems like anything I try to do to help isn't helpful. It, and so talk a little bit about like that experience of being a son and going through the darkness and, and what would be supportive for you having gone through that from the male perspective from your, your mom or your dad? Well, the first thing is, if we don't domesticate our children, somebody else is going to, and we're not going to like it. The moment that we are aware that knowing that our children is not our best friend, it is our children, and we're programming the children with our love. So one thing that helped me is that my father always was, and my mother was always, you know, big heart. And I, I go out and I return. But the beautiful thing ab about this is that now being an adult, I can see the magic that we can give to children. It's not to tell them what they should do or what they shouldn't do. 
it's about being an example of how we're living our life because kids look up to us. Even if they're not our children, people look up to us, kids look up to us on how we live our life and we never realize who we're touching, who are we, who are we giving the, the, the reflection of life with. So this is my answer. You know, when you are the love of your life and kids see you do, seeing living that, that's the clear message. But if they see you drinking on the weekend, complaining about your spouse, and all the stuff, well, guess what? The kids are going to become a perfect image of that. And they're not going to even know it, but they're going to try to grow up fast and become something they're not. And this is something about that I learned in life. That's why grandma said, we believe in a world full of magic. And she, they were an example to me that I rebelled against, that I resisted at then. But in my own rebellion, in my own, let's say, stupidity, when I was in the dark time putting myself there, I could hear their voice even louder. And it's because they told me things with love. And, it, and they had to have faith that I will go and rebel, but in that moment, see the light and see the clarity and see the opportunity. That's why no one really um, embraces things they have until they're gone. And, and when I was losing my own light and love in my darkest world, when I was in, in the addiction world as a teenager, I could feel the love of my parents shining even more that I could always return back to them because they never shut, it, they never shut the door because they always respected themselves too, and they never pretended to enable me to do something I'm not. Oh, that's so powerful. I think that, um, you know, as a person who I so respect the tradition that you've been raised in, and that it has been passed down from generation to generation, that's such powerful magic. I, I view that as the condor magic that we're integrating now with our eagle, you know, our eagle vision. Um, but I think that medicine is really needed in Western culture right now, that medicine of love and community and family and staying with the difficult conversations, not leaving, because Western seems to have a, like a desire to leave, like slam the door and walk away and leave and, you know, block and all this and disposable people. And I, I see that the, the benefit of the condor medicine is staying with the person through the challenge, through the shadow, through the darkness, and getting um, greater capacity to stay present with them through those hard moments and to keep your heart open and not walk away. Yes, exactly, because that's the message of love that we're giving. And as a, as a parent, as a guide, you know, when one gives life to somebody, you know, they, in, in sometimes in the Western world, also in Mexico and America grows, when they're 18, they want to leave home, you know. And some parents say, okay, I'm done with my work, but no. It's never done. It's like my father said, you didn't ask to be born in this world. I put you in. So I begin having the awareness of becoming a, a parent of a 10-year-old, of a 20-year-old, of a 30-year-old, of a 50, but everything begins to change because he said, you used to play with toys. Now you play with knowledge, but I'm always be there for you as a reflection of love. And this is what the whole society of tradition is about. Many people go into the ceremonies, into the rituals, into the theories, but it's all about the respect and love for our, for our families. He, many people run away from their families and talk about love and spirituality, but they run away from their families and never embrace it because they're running away from something. So when you don't run away from anything, that you're home, that is the family right there because that's what the ancestors talk about because back then there was no, okay, I'm leaving home, I'm going to become, a, I'm going to college, or I'm going to go to become this or become that. No, we're all just grateful to be alive, to be a tribe. And the illusion is real because the domestication wants to pull you from different sides, and it's beautiful, you know, don't get me wrong. But what it really matters for a spiritual community is to know that you are a family as well, because the same elements that exist outside exist in ourselves, because if our heart and mind are not merging together, we'll be in disharmony, and our family will be a mess because we're pretending. But the moment that our mind and heart are in service to one another, then we can be with the family. And what do I mean by that, the heart and the mind be together? is that we will not betray ourselves with our own words. If we have a heartbreak, we're not going to run away and pretend things are not there. If we're in love with somebody and that somebody is hurting our children, we're not going to pretend that person is not hurting our children. We're going to have to overcome and see the truth. And this is one of the beautiful things about, you know, not making assumptions. It's going to not be afraid to speak out loud and speak our truth. Because that's why many people are afraid of, because, you know, they're pleasers. We're pleasers. They're grateful, sacrificers, you know, let me walk all over me, not having awareness that even if we're male, we carry the body of divine mother earth, the body of the mother. 
So how we treat ourselves is how we treat her. And then we say, powerful woman, powerful things, but yet again, we're sabotaging ourselves as men and women, and the children are seeing that. So how can we even grow? It comes a moment that we come respect for our body, that for me, as we talk to one another, we discover something in me that my mind is the performer, and my heart is the audience. If I do something of love and my heart please, it feels happy. But if this performer begins saying sad things and breaking heart, this will feel heavy. And just imagine if we have a story, a heavy storyteller that does that to our family. We say we love them all much, but we say, oh, look at my victimization. Look how I'm suffering. Then we begin to manipulate them because we're not manipulating ourselves. And that's the important thing about waking up to have no more excuses or justification. Why are not we walking our path? Now, when we wake up from this, it doesn't matter if we're parents to our, our children or we are just adopting someone else's children or just hanging around as a school teacher with no time. They're looking up for love. And it's coming for the hummingbird um, medicine. The hummingbird is the messengers of the God. And you see all those little kids, like little hummingbirds, you know, waiting to be fed. You know, they cannot feed them. They're, they're, in, a, they're in a nest. They cannot fly. They, they depend on somebody to bring the, the, the nectar to them. And this is exactly an effort of you know, When we grow up, we experience he heaviness, pain, and we experience heavenly bliss. So now we have the responsibility. What are we going to share with the little ones? And I see many times, you know, parents fighting among themselves, screaming. And then a seven-year-old kid and a five-year-old kid were imitating their parents, fighting. And imagine when they're 20 years old, if they're already doing it at that young age. That's why when we wake up, it's a social responsibility. And, you know, one day we're not going to be here on earth. But like I said, the hummingbird medicine will. That's really powerful to be... Um... The, to realize that we are modeling all the time for our children. And, uh, you know, in my life, I could go into some judgment over that because my first part of my life, I was in the delusion. I was in the, the Maya. I was in my victimization. I was in my story. And I was trying really hard to get out of it, but I didn't have the right tools. I didn't, and maybe probably deep inside, I didn't have the right willingness, really, the true willingness to let the parasite go. And um, when, I, when I walked out of my life, I sort of, everything had to just sort of burn down, you know, in order to move forward. And when that happened, I met Heather Ash and other teachers that helped me start going at things from a different perspective, a different view. And then everything changed. And that is really when Hummingbird came in for me was that it came powerful in a vision. This Hummingbird came through in this drum journey vision and I didn't make it happen, and it was just there, and it was like spirit when the awe comes in and all the rainbow light and everything is like, whoa, you know, like <laughs> there is something magical here. What is this? And my life started like changing. So now I'm in this process of, of like, and uh, many people in my audience are, have had that experience of being through a lot of darkness and a lot of um, pain and suffering from this parasite thinking and wanting to change it. And now we change and now everyone has to catch up, right? Like we're, now we wait for everyone to catch up to us. Like, cause we just, we brought it into our family lineage where it needed healing, right? The ancestral line needed some healing. And so here we are, we give the healing and now we're waiting for our family to catch up like both directions, my children, my mother, like, okay, I've, I bred, and now I have this huge love bomb and I'm like, just, you know, like we're waiting for everyone to, to be ready to receive that. So what do we do in the waiting process? How do we, how do we show up with our well, journey the, the, now? The, the, thing, the, the thing is, not, there's nothing to wait for, sister. They have the right to live their dream. The beautiful thing is for us to love them just the way they are. And that's what I mean. And sometimes we go visit ghosts. They want to live because sometimes going forward is painful for them. And they prefer to be in a level of awareness where they cannot catch up because, you know, that's what they want to go and that's what they they do because forgiving ourselves is the most magical thing and forgiving is not necessarily that we have to talk to all the people that we hurt to hurt no that is past 
the moment that we forgive is to not repeat the things that we used to do in the past and, and not repeat it with the people that we know now and that we will know in the future. Now, with this awareness, we forgive ourselves. You know, imagine if one day we, we lose our parents. They were living a nightmare, but we lose our parents. But all of a sudden, we wake up in a dream where our parents are still alive, no matter what they believe in, no matter what negativity they are in their habit lives. It says, I just love you. It's good to see you again. It's good to feel you. No matter what you believe, no matter what you grow up in your head, you can, you know, have a different religion in your mind that you pass that it's not ours, but that doesn't separate us because we respect our dream. That's why I said there's nothing to wait for because it's golden time. And sometimes when we're waiting for someone to change, we miss on that golden time because it's the now, because tomorrow can be over, you know, could be the last thing to be that could ever do, you know, so I'm very grateful to it, and you know? I'm very happy to it, you know, that I get to do it one more time. I can be alive tomorrow again. So this is the beautiful thing I'm talking about, is to forgive ourselves from planning something to be preparing us in life when we're already prepared. Oh, I hear that so much, and I love that. And I think that leads us into the medicine bag because the medicine bag in our own hearts is what we need to pay attention to, right? So, like, um, as I feel the things, you know, for me, I love to be so close. I love to be close with the people I love. And sometimes the people I love don't want to be close, right? And that's their choice. Mm -hmm. And in that meantime, of me feeling that is my opportunity, right, to work on the medicine bag in my heart. So tell us more about that. Yeah, the medicine bag for me is what I hold sacred in my heart. What's dear in my heart and why I honor life. Like, I have my father, my parents, my grandmother in my heart, my brothers and sisters, my partner. I have my rings that people have given to me because now I honor that, that wakes the intent. I have so much faith in my, my heart that wakes up an intent of feeling. And when I told that, I create stories that, you know, that I was a scorpion, a thing is over his own tail doing that. And I said, what's happening here? Oh, I'm not, I'm not sacred to my heart. I'm not honoring my heart. And that is when I heard somebody growing up, fake it till you make it. And I go, there is no fake it till you make it. Or you, you do, you don't do. Because fake it till you make it is to be a perfect image for the outside dream. And it's like the man in the iron mask, you know, he will never show its beauty of face because it's trapped by the outside judgment because he put himself the judgment when the moment he takes off that mask and begins feeling its own beauty, it feels that, you know, we're beautiful just the way we are. And we hear our own message that's inside of our heart. If we like it, we continue, but if we don't like it, let's put attention to it. Let's now get comfortable in the uncomfortableness. Let's do yoga without the physical body movements like in the floor. Let's do yoga in the mind, okay? If this starts making me uncomfortable, it's because over me. And that's when everything will begin to change in my life because that's when I wake up and I wake up from my own dream. Not everybody else's dream. Everybody's still in their own dream, but I wake up in my dream saying, okay, I don't, I, I don't like this. I can change it. And, and that's powerful, sister. When you realize that you can let go of stories that is turns into a curious application where we're not happy and, you know, we, we feel the liberation. So that's awareness. Now it's the master of transformation. And how are we going to do such transformation? By loving ourselves. I'm doing it for the love of my life. I'm doing it for Divine Mother. Even if I'm male, I'm doing it for Divine Mother because Divine Mother lives in me because how I treat myself is how I'm treating her. And how I treat everybody else is how I'm treating her as well. Now I can see the illusion is what creates separation, especially in these times, because these times have been always here. That's the thing. Right now, they're putting it up there, but these times have always been here. There's always things that want to cut our wings. There's always things that make us cut our own wings. But when we come here, we know that we're involved in time. And, you know, it could be a more difficult time, like the time of the Inquisition, where if we even pay two times, we get put into the gallows pole. No, the times are changing. The dream is changing. Yes, the injustice and the the wounds are still here, and that's why it's all happening, because there's corrupt hummingbirds passing wounds, passing the corruption of spirituality, passing the false nest. That's why to keep the tradition alive, my grandma says, if you copy me, you're killing the total tradition. If you copy your dad, it's because it's not me. And you can see how many people go into the past, try to live, try to wake up characters that they, of their own past lives, you know, and, and, and they believe that they do that because, and they're paying the price right now because of the karma, what they did past lives. That's a beautiful and a, and a painful uh, teaching right there because that makes us feel like no, no matter what we do, we're going to suffer. And it's not true. 
we're not paying for nobody's karma. We're not paying for karma. It's just somebody else's story because no one knows what's going on inside our life. And this is when everything begins to change. I just, I wanted to say that there's something really powerful in what you're talking about with we can change our ourselves and change the story that we're telling ourselves and that that actually changes the external reality. I want to get into that a little bit because because I realized along the way that my story is actually causing my reality to happen. And if I can change the story that I'm telling, that I can have like a whole different reality come up in my in my life. Like even people would start to behave differently than they were before. Have you had that experience of uh, things changing around you as you change your story? Yes, absolutely, because it's contagious. Like negativity is contagious, positivity is contagious. And especially people who say, you cannot do that, you cannot do that because you're like that. And then all of a sudden they haven't seen you in a year. So, oh my God, you did it. I always knew you could do it. <laughs> but it, 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 it's a very interesting thing. Like one example that I had is that like uh, six years ago, I was totally unhealthy. My stomach was, my heart was, my liver was all bad. I was weighing more than 258 pounds, more than uh, 110 pounds that I normally should weigh. And one day I had an epiphany that I was going against my body, that I was hurting my body because of the eating ways that I was doing. Yes, I was taking care of my mind, but I wasn't taking care of my body and I have all the justifications until one day I got sick and I went to the hospital and I had an epiphany that I was sick because of all the foods I put into my body. Then I realized that my body is like a puppy and it's looking up to me what I do. And that's why I dis discovered that this is Mother Earth's body because it's like a puppy, it's a living being separately than me. And then from that point on, I begin the sort of tradition that's something to learn, but I learn. I begin to learn my eating ways, my negative habits, that nothing can care of my body. And you know, a year and a half later, I lost more than 100 pounds. I got rid of my fat uh, disease in my, in my heart, in my liver, in my stomach. And I, all I need to go, I cured everything that was in my body. And uh, my, my skin wasn't yellow anymore. It became more alive. I stopped taking the medication the doctor gave me now and just have to get B12 because I went into a vegan and a lifestyle because that, that felt good to my consciousness. But I learned it and, and I came back from the dead. But I could have so many excuses, many justifications. Well, when I started living this way, uh, my, my mother began coughing in the scene. She, you know, telling, oh my God, you lost weight. Oh my God, you did this. So little by little, she started changing her ways that she eats. Not that I imposed her way because I still cook food for her that she likes. But she, she little by little started changing. And also with some friends of mine, they did the same thing. It's because when you begin doing a transformation, it's an inspiration to somebody else. That's why I say, we never know who, who are looking up to us, especially the young children. Like I was a kid and I look up to the kids who were like in their 20s when I was 13, because I was wanting to grow up. So that's why I say, when you're authentic, oh my God, when you're authentic to your love of your life, you just shine. If there's something contagious about you, the people just want to be around you because you know, you're authentically where you want to be, enjoying life. Yeah, authentically being where you want to be. And letting, I, I had this beautiful acronym that came to me. I don't know who said it, but it was gorgeous. It's uh, for acronym for love. And it said, let others voluntarily evolve. And I have been really listening to that and working hard on that to just be in my own space, in my own joy, in my own love, in my own whatever the divine is giving me right now, being with that, and then letting everybody else do whatever it is that they're doing and just hold love for them. Like, I love you and I hope to be with you. And then, and then, just, and then just be. And whenever I do that, I'm super happy. And whenever I go into back into trying to change things or be with, you know, change some story or be with somebody else or interfere, it always, it brings back that negative element. So it's really, I think it is about letting others voluntarily evolve. Yes, and, and I love what you share because that's about respect. When you yeah. respect somebody else's dream, your dream is respected. But if you disrespect somebody else's dream, then you're targeted to get disrespected. I love what you say. Thank you for that, sister. That is so powerful what you just said. That is, yeah, it's respecting somebody else's dream. 
I remember when my dad had um, a really rare form of leukemia, and it was stagnant. It wasn't, it wasn't anything in his body, but it was there. And everyone was afraid he was going to die. And um, I remember I wanted him to do energy healing. <laughs> Because I had done energy healing, right? And it helped me. So I wanted him to do it. And uh, and he told me one day, Don Jose, he said, you know, Carrie, you're a really good leader. But in my life, you need to be a follower. And that was powerful for me. I was like, okay, I love you. I'm going to follow you. And so I feel like there's some element of following as well in other people's lives. Yes, absolutely. Because it's, it's respecting their world. It's like, um, let's say I, I met somebody who has a, a little ego in their world and think instead of wanting to learn from somebody else, they wanted to impose and says, go to these little temples around the world and says, hey, instead of, uh, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You should, that's pointless to do that. But it, it loses the point of view. That, that's how they live in their world. And, um, and if you try to impose it, nothing different than the conquistadors, like the conquistadors that came into Mesoamerica and, and imposed that religion onto them because they thought they were saving them from themselves, you know. But no, the moment comes when we begin respecting all traditions. Like I love to go to India a lot, and I come from the Totec tradition. So when I go to India, I put the Totec tradition into the back seat, and I begin to learn how they speak. And the same thing I go when I go to different cultures because what I'm learning is to how to learn how to translate what I know in my heart instead of imposing because they have their own language. And this is why this world is in the world of the, of the gods because it's a world of competition. My God is better than your God. My truth is better than your truth. That people are wanting to domesticate one another because they don't have faith in themselves. And the moment that you have faith in yourself, you don't care to put your God to fight or your belief to fight because they don't need to because you don't need to prove anything to nobody because you know that in your heart. So when you know this in your heart, why do you want to debate something that is a lie? It's just ego and personal importance that wants to be right. Because where I come from, there is no chosen one. There is no pedestal. We all are the same. And a lot of traditions like to be in the pedestal and the chosen one because that's the power of the cookie. And one day, sister, my dog teach me the power of the cookie. Why? Because he was watching the other dogs eating the cookie so fast. He held it. But then when he held it, he knew that the other dogs wanted his cookie. So he learned how to control them by sharing his cookie with them at the right moment. But this is where I'm coming from. How many people in life manipulate other people because they have the power over water? They have the power over electricity. They have the power over religion. And they see the weak mind, so they become the villain, and they know the power of the cookie, and it becomes corrupt. And this is why this dream of the God is so corrupt because they're constantly finding who is the right God, who's the right, who's right, but they're all right because we all are tackling the addiction of suffering together. And that's why I love the dream of Jogananda. When he came from India, he united all the seven different religions that were different points of views, but they work for the same boss. And this is where I'm coming from. For me, language is just made up to communicate to one another that we put language into a pedestal. But it's it's nothing. What's really important is what we put inside the words. Like our bodies, there's nothing until the spirit that we are comes inside the body that makes everything move. Mm. And when we become aware that we have power of the word, that becomes impeccability because impeccable means without sin. So when you know and you know the word that's coming out of you like a hummingbird, now you collected the nectar, but now you're delivering it as a lifestyle. And that changes everything. Because you're not trying to change the world outside of you because you're just changing yourself. But that's the holy grail that they always try to find and never found because it was just a metaphor. It's a philosophy. Everything in religion, shamanic, swamis, every story in words is just philosophies that people put into the truth. But it's just to communicate a metaphor to get the point. <sighs> that is so powerful. Yeah, there. it's like... Even a word is just a word. However, it's the energy you speak it with too. There's a frequency. So I could say a statement and I could say it with different energies and it would, it would be different things too. So it's not just like, I love you. It's like, I love you. There's just different, you know, there's just different energies. And to, to, to learn how to speak 
a message of love is not just to say the right words even. It's like to feel it, to embody it, and to be it for yourself on the inside first. And then as you go out there, this is what I'm learning and working on, is to is to share it, you know? And if people want it, they want it. And if they don't, they don't. And to respect that choice as well. Um, I think that a lot of light workers, we feel sometimes there is that superiority feeling, right? The hierarchy is there. And there is no hierarchy. We're all learning together. So I don't I don't see that hierarchy. I see people wanting it, but I feel like that's also part of that conditioning that we need to let go of. Yes, because it's a corruption and a second attention when the mask tempts one. When people put the mask on somebody and now they pretend to be something they're not. Because no matter who we are, no matter what matters are in the earth, they are human too. They have a bad day too. And they have things that, you know, they're human and, and many people pretend they're not human. They don't have emotions, but if we don't feel our emotions, it's like shutting up Divine Mother and putting a tape over her mouth. The body communicates to us. And like my brother Junior taught me, he said one time, Jose, there's so many people who use the truth with so much poison that it's not impeccable anymore. There are people who are not ready to hear the truth. And people come with so much poison with hurting it. Impeccability is, like my brother says, not in the word, but in our intent. Because when we're impeccable with our intent, we can see where the world needs and the world doesn't need, where we can help and where we cannot help. And there's so many people who wear a mask, pretend they can help because that's what they kind of be. And, and I tell you, it's a trap. It's a day that they will never come fully because it's just like having a beautiful credit. So like one day, my dad had a heart attack and he was in a nine-week coma. And he described in one of those dreams, he was a perception coming out of his body. And then he opened through the world and went through space and another planet opened up. And when he entered the planet, there was a lot of hundreds of people in white. And there was this golden chair and says, oh, my God, you have finally come. Our leader has come. And she, your, your chair is waiting for you. And he was, oh, no, that's not my chair. This is that dream. is not mine. And if it was a personal importance, it will say, yes, this is my chair. This is my people. But no, it's a trap. It's a trap to pretend that we're the chosen one because you're never going to be human. You always want to be the person in the altar who is dead, the people are praying to. No. That is personal importance and running away. That's why we all have the moment where we come from. Like, you know, many people have given me the, the mask or the title of shaman, nagwa, swami, and eagle of the north, and so many other titles that I honor them in beautiful, but I know the truth in my story because I was just another kid who grew up in a bad neighborhood that got addicted to drugs and lost itself. Now I find myself. And all those people that give me all those titles was to give me power so I can overcome myself. But I know that it was just like Dumbo using the magic feather. It was never about the magic feather. It was about me having that intent that I don't want to suffer anymore. And many people get stuck with the magic feather. And they die for the magic feather. And they lose their awareness for their magic feather. Oh, gosh. You know, I think my magic feather is White Eagle, <laughs> who is my guide. <laughs> And he's a magic feather for sure, but you know, but the part of the journey has been to um, not disassociate from my life journey, but to go back through and really own every single choice I made, every person I was with love, like compassion, like all the people I ever was, all the women I ever was are welcome at my table. Like I, if I wouldn't be who I am today if it hadn't have been for all the people I was before. I have to love and own all of that. Yes, exactly, because that's us. And, and it's like the rattlesnake, you know? It, it, it was part of our skin, but it's not anymore. It's gone. But that made us what we are now. That's why I said never forget where we come from, and we always will be grateful. And really honoring the journey. But I, I heard you say at one point that you um, realized, you saw a painting and you realized uh, that the people were they're walking away from each other, that it's time to let go of certain things. So there are ways in which um, there was a part of my journey that I just wanted to walk away from who I had been. I just wanted to escape that person. I wanted to reinvent myself. And, and I did. I reinvented myself with spirit, 
and all these beautiful gifts. And, and then I went back and reclaimed myself. Like I went back and said, okay, I love you. I love all these people that I've been and it's all integrated back in. It's so where, where do you feel in that? Because sometimes, sometimes there is a space of letting go, but sometimes there's also a space of, of reclaiming. So where, where do you stand on that? What's your perspective? Well, it's always to honor the love of your life and to tell yourself the truth. Like my first thing I can share with about this is my first marriage. The first years were so ha magical, but then we started disrespecting one another because we both were not happy. But we know we stayed, we stayed in a relationship, but the moment that I knew that my partner was hurting herself with myself, what am I supposed to do if I got that awareness? I love her so much that I had to remove myself from that because it's not serving anymore. I could pretend all my life and I could still be married another 10 years and another 10 years of giving her to use me to hurt herself and then doing the same thing. Once I got the awareness, I go, okay, this love was, this love got corrupted, but I still love her enough that I will let this dream go so she can find her own truth because with us together, we're holding on to the past and it's no longer truth. So that was one example that I did. And another one was the, my eating waste too. I could have hold on to that, but one day I woke up and said, hey, I talk about loving consciousness, but look at how I'm treating my body. I cannot go anymore speaking like I am, knowing that I'm betraying myself. And where I'm coming from is about consciousness. The Egyptians knew it. In order to enter heaven, your heart must be like as a feather. Of course, they're not talking about their hearts. They're talking about their consciousness because our consciousness makes us betray ourselves, betray others or be loyal to ourselves and be loyal to others. So when we're in consciousness, it's because we are nothing to hide, our heart's an open book, and we're ready to be alive because we are alive. On the other hand, we're dead in life. Yeah, so what I'm hearing you saying is that your act of leaving your marriage is actually an act of loyalty with love because it, you saw that it was not respecting your dream and not respecting her dream. Exactly. Hmm. And I could have, and I could have used many excuses, like many times I tried to return, but I wasn't returning to her. I was returning to that nightmare mm -hmm. because that's the addiction I had until I broke out of it. Time healed it. And this is where I'm telling everybody, time heals everything. Hmm. We let go, but if we continue feeding it, it will never get healed because we're opening the wound like Junior says. We keep cutting and, and, and we complain. We're never getting healed but because we're always complaining. And that's something that I learned, the master of complaining is complaining about my beloved, complaining about myself, complaining why I'm not happy. And I'm the hummingbird of complaining. I'm <laughs> correcting the hummingbird messenger. But once I know gossip, hypocrisy, and all that, that that takes away from my soul, then I change my language. And I know that other people speak it, but I don't necessarily have to speak it or have to be afraid to be around it because it's not my language. It's like my father says, you know, all those people, that talk about mad about our tribe and our race, you know, we don't take them personal because we know it's not true. Yeah, it's, it's, it's where it touches the wound within you. And if there's a wound within you that responds with outrage, then that's for you to heal, right? That's a place of healing within. Yeah, because in the addiction of suffering, there's an addiction to fighting because one mind's always in fight with itself. So it always look for a host to fight with. If it's a partner, a friend, and that's when we become toxic friends. When people, they're just hurting their friends and they don't let them grow. You know, like I have my, my partner, you know, one of her good friends, you know, it was not at her that, you know, it, it, it reported her with Instagram and broke her heart just because of a painting. And, you know, it was painful, but you know, I don't know why I'm saying this a lot, but I see, you know, even adults doing that, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I tell you, when the moment that we stop playing those games, you know, we begin respecting our temple and home. And, and like I said earlier about, the, like you mentioned earlier, I'm sorry about the painting, about two people walking away from each other. It doesn't mean they don't love each other. It just means that part of their story is over. Because once you know that something's hurting the love of your life, your body, Mother Earth, you stand up. Just like if you would have awareness that somebody's abusing your kid in kindergarten, if it's a teacher of another kid, mm -hmm. if you find out, you will not leave your kid there to prove a point, make it, everything will be better. No. With no questions asked, you take the kid out because you know that's going to get abused and no talk is going to make you feel better because you're not letting your kid there alone anymore. 
Yeah, and making those decisions and realizations is challenging, especially if we're just in our minds, right? So how does the how does the ritual and ceremony support you to get out of your mind and into a space where you can actually let go? Self respect. That's the ultimate tool of the Toltec. It's like my partner says, if somebody doesn't want to be with me, why do I want to be with this person? Mm. If somebody screams at me, disrespect me, why am I there hearing all these screams? If someone's cutting my wings, why am I there? And it's not that they won't want me with, they're using me. But believe me, they will find another host. And maybe me leaving, they will give awareness for that person. Hey, maybe it's not them, maybe it's me. Mm, so powerful. Enabling is powerful. Yes, enabling is very powerful. And when we look at it, we can see who we give power to enable us. Yeah, because when, um, as I've made, I've actually had some experience with this because there was somebody in my life, there is somebody in my life that I had that dynamic with. And as I separated from that dynamic over the last year and a half or so, my whole life just took off crazy, you know, just wonderful things happening and my book and all this great stuff, right? And it just seems like magic. And, uh, yeah, so I pay attention to that. You know, I pay attention to, wow, that's really interesting that with that dynamic gone, actually a lot of really beautiful things are happening in my life. Yes, and that's a beautiful thing. We take the weight off. The ego is not carrying stones anymore, so it can flip its wings to fly wherever direction it wants to go. But with all those rocks and weight, how can we fly? And that's the consciousness of the, of, of the Egyptian mythology. But the consciousness is when we're loyal to the ego so it can fly and lift its wings because nobody belongs to the ego. The ego is free in the sky. The ego is free in the sky. And respecting is honoring that each person has, a, has that right to be free in the sky. Yes. We live in a world of 7 billion artists. <laughs> and if we go to an art gallery, we don't take our painting supplies, you know, to paint, paint over somebody over? else's art. <laughs> yeah, we go to enjoy their art. Because then we get kicked out. <laughs> that is so true. That's such a good analogy. That is beautiful. <laughs> Well, what a powerful um, teaching, and I know that people are going to be interested in reading your new book, The Medicine Bag, Shamanic Rituals and Ceremonies. I want to see if I can see you one last time. I'm going to ask to start your video, see if, see if we're, our internet connection can do it <laughs> one more time. Oh, yeah. There you are. Oh. Yes, I didn't know where I went. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you, but yeah, I didn't forgive see me that I, for, 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 Forgive me that I'm grabbing. Hey, it's my little puppy. <laughs> Oh. That, that I'm driving, I, 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 I have my house in a, my house, my house in the market, so there's a lot of movers out there in the house, so I had to get out of the car. And my oh. puppy just seeing people pass. Hey, it's your little puppy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure. <laughs> Such a pleasure, Don Jose. I, I want to respect your time and your commitment, and uh, I just want to say I love your light. The light that you bring to the world, I, I just, I love your big heart. I can feel your heart. And that, for me, I'm a feeler. So I'm, I feel, and I feel your heart shine. And it's powerful, oh. beautiful. And thank you so much oh. for, for doing all that shadow work and being willing to show up with your big love. Oh, thank you, sister. Thank you for your kindness. And, and thank you. We, we both work for the same heart. I see what the, the thing you said about me, I see in you too, because there's no separation. And I know that people listening to, we're all resurrecting because we all have the seed. And now we just have to water it and make our life a masterpiece of art because that's what we're here for, to enjoy our honeymoon. And don't let anybody tell you, we'll see when the honeymoon is over. No, when you meet the love of your life, that's it. The wedding vows are done. So that do us part. That is so true. Gosh. Woohoo. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Don Jose, and everybody, I hope you share this you. out, and, uh, and thank you so much, and I'm going to give everybody kisses on the way out, so here they come. Love you guys. Mm -hmm. See you next time on Soul Nectar. Bye for now. <laughs>